Thanks for tuning in to Manage the Moment, Conversations in Performance Psychology. I'm Dr. Sari Shepard. Welcome back to part two of my conversation with Tom Mesero, one of the best known and most highly regarded courtroom lawyers of our time. Despite some technical difficulties, Tom and I were able to finish our conversation, and in this second half, we delve into Tom's unconventional techniques in the courtroom. There are tough days. You just can't overreact to them. You know, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I try challenging cases. I try cases that people warn me not to take. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. Tom often goes against the expected grain in his craft as a courtroom attorney. But in doing so, he makes himself the most effective lawyer that he can be. You'll hear Tom talk about things like how he manages controversy and what he believes makes not just a good, but a great lawyer. Things like taking risks and having confidence in your own approach. We talk about managing the tough days, the unexpected moments, the tense courtroom exchanges, and how Tom avoids the perils of fame in his own celebrated life and career. Here's part two of my conversation with Tom. Well, Tom, thank you again for sitting down with me. My pleasure. Thank you. When we last spoke, we were discussing the unexpected, and okay. then the unexpected happened to my digital recorder. Okay. <laughs> but if we can start up again there, I know that you prepare diligently for the trials um, that, that you present and do a lot of reading even when, when the day is over in the, in, in the courtroom. And yet, even as prepared as you may be, the unexpected often happens. Well, the unexpected always happens in trials, and that's one of the appeals of trials if you're built for this type of thing. I think every trial is unique. The chemistry between the judge, the jury, the prosecution, the defense, the jurors is uh, a type of energy and a type of process that has never happened before and will never happen since. So every trial is a learning experience. Every trial... uh, forces you to step into the unknown and react uh, in the appropriate way. Um, And that's sort of the attraction of trials. Now, some people are completely turned off by that pressure and that type of unexpected uh, process, but I I thrive on it. And I think most trial lawyers who really like what they do, they thrive on that as well. And I imagine the pressure that you feel doesn't just come in that form because you really do hold someone's life in your hands. You do. You know, the way our system works, in the civil courts, we argue over property and money. In the criminal courts, we argue over reputation and freedom. And uh, many times you hold someone's life in your hands, and if you lose in a certain way, they could spend the rest of their life in prison or worse. And I've done death penalty cases, and uh, you really hold a life in your hand uh, in a death penalty case. And you mentioned reputation, too. So sometimes you might have a a defendant who's acquitted, found to be not guilty of the charges that they faced, and yet reputation is still damaged. That can be a very, very difficult part of our system. But when I say reputation's at stake, what I primarily mean is if you have a criminal conviction, it can follow you the rest of your days, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Now, there are ways that these convictions can be you know, expunged uh, or softened. Um, But nevertheless, uh, to walk through the rest of your life with a criminal conviction can seriously affect your employment, um, seriously affect uh, your ability to be persuasive in certain situations. It can affect you in all kinds of ways. So that's when you really have to be prepared for the unexpected. You've said that you don't get too excited or, or feel too good after a good day in court, and you don't become too dejected after a bad day. I don't believe in overreacting because it's a process and each part interacts with every other part and you know you can talk to experienced trial lawyers will tell you some of the best work they did where it was in trials they lost and you can see someone stumble around and not know what they're doing at all and when because it's not just a popularity contest among attorneys. I mean jurors are trying to do the right thing. They're being hit from all sides with different arguments and interpretations. Um, and um, it's, it's not over till it's over, as Yogi Berra, the old baseball player, used to say. So, you know, I think one of the earliest painful lessons a trial lawyer learns is when you do a fantastic cross-examination when you're young and you think you've won and then you lose. So uh, it's a very unpredictable, uncertain process, but good trial lawyers thrive on it and see it as a challenge gets their adrenaline flowing, and that's one of the things we do. 
And part of your strategy is to be yourself in the courtroom, is that right? I firmly believe that uh, one of the greatest opportunities in life for anybody is to find out who they are and be comfortable with who they are. It just so happens to also be a benefit in the courtroom. If you know who you are, if you're at peace with who you are, if you're comfortable with who you are, and you're real, that can take you a long way. And as I've said many times in lectures to law students, to practicing lawyers, I said, you know, we've seen theatrical, dramatic lawyers who are fake and very ineffective. We've seen very deadpan, somewhat boring, methodical lawyers who are very effective because they come across as real, they come across as honest, and fighting for something they believe in. So that's, that's an integrity and a truth within yourself. And yet the jury, you've mentioned, always assume that you know the truth even if you don't. So while <laughs> That's you walk, correct. So you walk into the courtroom being true to yourself and, and true to your role in the courtroom. But no matter, no matter what you may or may not know about the person you represent, the jury always assumes you do. In my opinion, yes. And that's a generality. That's a, that's a perception based upon decades of trying cases. And I think they think the lawyers really know what's going on. They know that everything is not coming into the trial. They've seen enough TV shows and enough, uh, you know, live trials on TV through the years to know that judges refuse to admit certain evidence. Judges will suppress certain evidence. Uh, there are certain rules of procedure and evidence that mean certain things can't be said or done in a courtroom. They know that, uh, but they assume the lawyers know everything, in my opinion. And part of what you have to manage then is your reaction to those unexpected things that might come from the bench. So I've read, for example, there were many things that were unexpected in in the Bill Cosby uh, trial, for example. Well, I tried the second Bill Cosby trial. The first trial ended up in a hung jury. Uh, Between the first trial and the second trial, the Me Too movement took off. Well, it's interesting. It was between the two trials. Ah. And what the judge did in the retrial, which I where I defended Bill Cosby was basically in the first trial he allowed one additional accuser to testify under the theory that this would show a propensity to act a certain way or a pattern of acting a certain way. Then we have the Me Too movement, then we show up for the retrial and he ups the one to five. So not only did we have the primary accuser in the case, the judge allowed five other women to testify that they were assaulted by Mr. Cosby, which is going to be a major issue on appeal as to whether, first of all, there was much similarity between the uh, the accusers, and second of all, uh, whether it was too prejudicial. So unexpected things that come from the bench, unexpected things that come from witnesses, because I know, for example, in the Jackson case, you had witnesses both that Well, I I guess multiple times witnesses that went in your favor in ways that you didn't expect. One witness who you thought might be very antagonistic who turned out not to be. And and then another witness, which perhaps you can um, just refer to, where your line of questioning led to something that opened up basically the the whole trial for you. I cross-examined the main accuser, who was a young person, 13 years of age. And... The general rule of thumb in, in criminal defense practice is be very gentle with children. You can easily look like a bully, you can easily look manipulative, and you could turn off the jury and even send the jury into the camp of the accuser uh, more than they may have started off as. Um, I had never examined this witness before. I had had a tremendous amount of material on his background, his school records, his medical records, uh, statements he'd allegedly made. Uh, I had volumes of material on on him. But I had to feel my way to decide how best to attack him. Uh, And I decided after watching him on direct examination when the prosecutor asked his questions, I decided to go right at him and hopefully change his demeanor right away and show there's another side of this person that maybe isn't the nicest. That was my strategy. It was unusual, um, and it proved to be effective. In fact, I got offers to speak to lawyers' groups around the country after the trial about my unconventional way of handling child witnesses because they were all shocked that somebody would do this and it would be effective. But I think what you're talking about is a cross-examination question that I asked that proved to be very effective. In fact, Professor Lori Levinson at Loyola Law School, who teaches criminal procedure and is called upon by the media quite a bit to opine on 
on you know current cases in the media and the news. She says my one particular cross-examination question won the case. And before I tell you what it was, let me also mention that lawyers are taught that when they cross-examine, you know, control the witness, keep them on a tight leash, ask leading questions, uh, factually driven, factually contained questions that suggest the answer, and keep them in, in a narrow bind. Don't let them just go wild and say whatever they want. And, and as part of that instruction, we're taught don't ask a how question and don't ask a why question, because those questions will let them just bring out the kitchen sink and it probably won't be favorable. When I was examining this young accuser, and based upon my research into he and his family, I came to the conclusion that they had developed some anger towards Michael Jackson. And I concluded that they got angry when they thought Michael Jackson was drawing away from them and they weren't going to be part of his family forever. So I asked this young accuser um, about certain events that went on at Neverland where they used to stay that I knew would bring up some anger. And for example, you know, did Michael Jackson tell you he wasn't going to be there on a certain day and you walked out of your cabin and you looked in the distance and you could see him? Didn't that happen? And he, he said yes, and or words to that effect. And I mentioned other instances where I thought he would be somewhat angry. And then I finally looked at him and said, you were really angry at Michael Jackson, weren't you? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. And he gave this long list of things that angered him about Michael Jackson, but never mentioned that he was molested. And that was a big gamble on my part. Could have ruined you know, the case for Michael Jackson. Could have ruined my career, frankly. Um, but I just decided to go for it when I thought it would be effective, and I was correct. Big moment in the trial, big moment in my career. Certainly. And, of course, again, that just speaks to how you manage your own emotions in the courtroom because you can be as prepared as any person could be. And I know that you, you do prepare extensively. You have binders on all of your witnesses and all of, all of this. Well, I like to have for each witness, I like every document that mentions that witness. And I would like them all in chronological order. And the documents can be police reports, they can be transcripts of testimony, transcripts of interviews, handwritten notes of interviews, newspaper articles, I don't care what it is. I like to have them in, 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 you know, in order, uh, dated order, chronological order, and I like to go through them and through them and through them, and I start to see patterns where, where maybe statements change or maybe statements are embellished because of certain intervening events. Um, and I develop a, a profile in my mind of how I'm going to attack the witness. It's fascinating. You have more than just one job. I mean, we think of a trial attorney as the person who presents information to the jury, but you, you're a detective of sorts, and you, you certainly have to be a, an accomplished presenter just to be able to phrase things in such a way that you connect to the jury. Well, you know, early in your career, you know, you write out all your questions, and you, you, you almost appear a slave to your, your notes and a slave to your questions, because, you know, not only have you put a lot of time into this, but you're not as confident in, in, in being spontaneous. You're not in co as confident in reacting to a certain statement and going in a certain direction and then coming back to where you were. Um, it's a skill that not everybody has, but I think reaction is very important, but don't lose track of where you want to go at the same time. So a witness will say something you never expected, and you'll see an opportunity to go in another direction ask questions in that direction, benefit from it, but you don't want to forget where you were because you were in that place for a particular reason. So a lot of it's in my head. Um, I go through documents repeatedly. I go through the evidence. I think of the story I'm telling. Um, I was very flattered in December. Uh, I had dinner with the uh, public defender of San Francisco a uh, great criminal lawyer who unfortunately passed away not long after we had dinner. It was a real tragedy. Jeff Adachi, one of the great criminal lawyers in America, <clears throat> and he, he had invited me to speak a couple of times to the San Francisco Public Defenders. And one thing he said, you said to us that changed our, really affected our office and changed the way we approach trials, 
you told us that there are four opportunities to tell your story in your opening statement, in your cross-examination of prosecution witnesses, in your direct examination of your witnesses, and in your closing argument. So Jeff told me that they were now teaching this uh, in their courses at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, which was a great compliment to me, and I really appreciated it and was glad I, uh, I had an impact on, uh, on that great office. It's one of the best public defender's offices in America. Um, these things are, are not always taught in law school. You have to, if you care about what you're doing and you realize it's a craft and an art, not a science, and that psychology is a complex thing, that you're always learning about, you try to figure out what's effective, what's persuasive, what makes an impact. And I remember one witness in the, in the Michael Jackson case, I had 20 binders of documents that I had been, they were all in chronological order. Uh, it was Michael Jackson's ex-wife, who everyone thought was going to help the prosecution. In fact, um, when I woke up that morning and was getting dressed and watching the morning shows, you know, they were talking about what a big day they expected for the prosecution. And she blew up in their face. She just turned out to be one of our best witnesses. And I didn't use one document in those 20 volumes. I just realized where she was going. I realized she was in a very delicate state. And I just very carefully and gently took her a few directions I wanted to take her. And it was a great day for us. And I remember the next morning getting ready for trial and the, the, the news stories, you know, Good Morning America and the Today Show were all saying the, the lead story was, words to the effect, did a, did a main prosecution witness blow up in their face? You know, that was the big story the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be prepared for, for things like that because it's just a very unpredictable process. And that's partly what's fascinating to me is the strategy that you have to maintain. And really, it's, it's largely on you to do this just singularly for, your, for yourself and for your client. Obviously, you have co-counsel that might support what you're doing, but, but as you say, really a lot of this is just taking place in your own mind. Well, I have to have help organizing. You know, I always have co-counsel who helps me organize and helps me put these books together. And, you know, uh, I try to pick people to work with who will compliment me. I can be a little bit of a mad scientist as I'm preparing, and I, I often prepare standing up, you know, in my office and walking around. Um, so trying in my mind to get my cross-examinations ready because a lot of what I do is quick and spontaneous and I'm not just looking at questions. See, another problem with lawyers who prepare in a conventional way is I just mentioned that I had 20 volumes of documents prepared for a witness and didn't use one of them because things just turned out to be so different. The problem with a lot of lawyers is when they're preparing for trial is if they invest time in preparation they want to use that preparation. You know, it, it becomes almost a narcissistic problem. You know, I did all this. I'm not going to scuttle it, throw it away. And they lose track of where the importance is. Um, the importance is trying to win the day for your client. And, um, you know, if you see that you don't need your preparation or it might be counterproductive, just go for it. Be spontaneous. React. Don't just pedantically read something because you spend so much time preparing it. So that speaks to the flexibility that you have to have in your mindset. You need to narrow your attention to what's essential for that day in your preparation, and yet you have to maintain a flexibility um, and, and I suppose a, a confidence within yourself to, to be able to, to abandon that preparation if, if it's called for. And it takes time to develop that. Not everybody has the ability to do it. They're not particularly facile on their feet. They're not particularly intuitive, they're not particularly instinctive the way I'm describing things. It's not for everybody, but uh, it's certainly where I belong. Do you find that at times it's your conviction, and only yours, that you have to rely on in order to move forward in a particular line of questioning or decision making? For example, do, if, you, if your co-counsel might even disagree with you, and, and you're, the, you're the one person who still has to maintain that, that track. Well, as I suggested before, if you're cross-examination, excuse me, if you're cross-examining a main prosecution witness, um, the gen one general rule of thumb is don't let them just keep talking and talking, object. You know, object if somebody just goes off on tangents and gives speeches because they're probably not going to help you. In the Michael Jackson case, I had examined the mother 
of the accuser in a pretrial hearing. It was a pretrial hearing where I didn't expect to win the issue that I was presenting to the court, but I really wanted to take a look at her. And she was a relevant witness in this evidentiary hearing. And I said to myself, you know, she's a loose cannon. She's going to go off in all sorts of different directions. And I think it's going to hurt the prosecution. So when she was called to the stand by the prosecutor, put on direct examination, she started just giving these speeches and talks. And he was looking at me, waiting for me to object. And I wouldn't object. I just said, the more she talks, the, the more she's going to bury them. And he kept looking at me, and finally he started objecting to his own witness, which looked terrible. So instead of me saying, objection, your honor, non-responsive, move to strike or answer, he was doing it. And it just compounded their problems and made, them, made their case look awful. Now, that was not something you normally do. There was a, a lawyer sitting with the defense, a very good lawyer, who kept looking at me, why are you letting this go on? And he didn't quite get what I was doing. Later on, when the jurors were questioned, they said she buried them. She buried them with her behavior, with her, 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 her statements. I mean, I did know what I was doing, but it was certainly not normal. And so sometimes the, the reinforcement, sometimes that support might not be where you would wish it to be. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, but let me just say something else. Uh, I'm a little bit more of a risk taker than most. I think there are trials I've won that I never would have won if I hadn't taken the risks I took. But if you're a risk taker, you get burned sometimes, too. Um, but I just decided at one point in my career that uh, the best trial lawyers, the ones who win the most cases, tend to be risk takers. Did that come from some sort of a confidence that you had in your own skill and ability to take those risks? Well, not early in my career. I think I had to learn who I was and learned who I, who I was uh, in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, I mean, I think we're always learning who we are if we're lucky. We're always evolving and hopefully changing and growing. Um, but I think that that applies to the courtroom as well. So early in my career, I was trying to do what I was taught to do. And I was trying to, you know, use the fundamentals of trial practice that I was taught in school, that you, that you, you have in books about how to try a case. And it was as I learned, that I said to myself at one point, what makes certain trial lawyers particularly great as opposed to good? What do these people have that the others don't seem to? And in the process of trying to figure that out through a lot of reading, a lot of watching, a lot of observation, I just decided they tend to be risk takers. They tend to take creative approaches to individual trials. They're not always successful. Sometimes it blows up in their face. But more often than not, I think they prevail in cases where others would not prevail. And look, I mean, I've always said if you follow the fundamentals, you'll never embarrass yourself. But you also won't win a lot of cases you possibly could win if you took some risks. The careful lawyer who won't take risks and, and, and routinely applies the fundamentals, if you read a transcript of what they do, they look perfect. A lot of the transcripts, if you read them cold, you know, without being in the courtroom and watching the person, some of them don't read too well. But some of these great lawyers, I mean, they make more better impression in front of the jury with the way they speak spontaneously and off the cuff than they do in a transcript. They don't look perfect. They might look disjointed. They might, might be a stream of consciousness coming out periodically. There might be all sorts of ways that they impress juries with their case that don't come across so well in print. So some of the best lawyers don't look that great in a transcript, and some of the mediocre lawyers look perfect. Speaking of transcripts and impressions, um, I know many Michael Jackson fans talk about the difference between the way Jackson is portrayed in the media, even currently, uh, and the way he was portrayed after the trial, after his not guilty verdicts, and what the trial transcripts actually reveal and point to. I recall watching the verdicts come in, and, and, um, and as anyone was in, in, in the country and actually across the globe, really being interested in what was happening in this very high-profile case. But we would hear snippets from the media um, on, on the news. Everyone watched the news in those days. We didn't have the social media that we do now. Um, but so we would hear little snip snippets about that and get an impression about what was happening in the courtroom. But it turns out it was often not really what was happening in the courtroom. Well, first of all, um, my experience with the media in that case, for the most part, was dreadful. Um, 
there were some very seasoned and very ethical professional journalists who covered the case, but very few of them, in my opinion. There was Linda Deutsch from Associated Press, a total pro. There was Mike Taibbi from NBC, complete professional, ethical. There was Dawn Hobbs from the San Santa Barbara News Press. She was just a perfect professional. Those three names come to mind, and I want to make sure I don't lump them into the rest of the group. But by and large, the media was atrocious. The media was arrogant. They were self-serving. You know, they wanted to see this, the, the most famous man in the world who took everything to great heights, dance, music, choreography. Uh, they wanted to see him splatter because it made a good story for them. It would bring revenue and ratings to them. And, you know, I, I had always been a Court TV fan. Court TV was on TV in those days. It's now back. Um, but I was always a Court TV fan. I loved to turn on. A, it was 24 hours throughout the 90s, you know, and you could watch, wake up at 2 in the morning, and if I felt like watching what a lawyer was doing, I could turn it on. And there was a lot of commentary, and uh, it, it really was, to me, a great resource. But the turning point was the Michael Jackson case, where they appointed someone who was anti-Michael Jackson, or had a history of being sued by him, and she claimed she had revealed she was the first journalist to reveal that he was a pedophile when she worked for a TV show. They assigned her to cover the case, which I thought was atrocious. They should have had a neutral, objective, experienced lawyer doing it, not someone with a history with Michael Jackson. So uh, I didn't think much of her to begin with, and I would come home from court. And we had a schedule where we'd start around 8 o'clock and be out by, I think, 1.30. And we wouldn't have a long lunch break. We would have 10 and... 10-minute breaks and 15-minute breaks. So I would get back mid-afternoon to my condominium, and I would turn on the TV for a little while to see what people were saying. And I would see the most biased, you know, slanted coverage. And what happened was the prosecution would typically call a witness who would say something very scandalous. And I would get up to cross-examine, and, and the media representative would run out of the courtroom to report the direct examination and not even watch the cross-examination. And I got to tell you, there, I, I was able to demolish so many of their witnesses in cross-examination. I remember every day I would come back saying, God, they're just getting a drubbing in this case. Um, but it wouldn't be reported, or it wouldn't be reported as much as the salacious material on direct examination was reported. So. Um, I developed a very, very negative view of the media throughout that case. And then the, during the week of jury deliberation, the major networks were showing the jail cell they expected him to go to and talking about the routine he would have, when he had to get up, what he would be served for breakfast, uh, would he be on suicide watch, what would, be, what would he be allowed to read, how many visitors could he take. I mean, they were showing this every day of jury deliberation like it was gospel. I mean, it was just irritating and infuriating to see that level of biased uh, journalism, or if you want to even call it journalism. But that was a very negative experience for me. Do you find that it varies case to case, how the media might portray a criminal defendant? I think, I think it does. Um, I haven't thought of that question before. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's something salacious about seeing someone convicted and hauled off to jail and and, sent, and, and come back in jailhouse orange or jailhouse yellow with chains around them. There's something salacious about that. Um, I don't think the media thinks very much about showing innocent people, people wrongfully charged, wrongfully convicted. You'll see a few shows like that. You won't see very many. <clears throat> I mean, let's face it. The last I checked, over 300 people had been freed from life sentences, death sentences, enormously long sentences through DNA technology. I mean, that's over 300 people whose lives and whose family lives were devastated by wrongful convictions. Now think of the people who haven't had DNA to test, who were wrongfully convicted based on faulty eyewitness identification. Think of the people where there was DNA but it wasn't tested for a variety of reasons. So our, our system is the best system in the world, but it's far from perfect. And lot, innocent people are destroyed, and the people around them are destroyed through wrongful convictions. So if the me media does cover some of this, uh, but I think in general, my perception is the media would rather just cover people convicted and sent to prison and uh, 
look like they're on the side of, uh, of you know, crime prevention, that kind of thing. We find ourselves in a new situation as well in contemporary times where things can be said about a person who is deceased. And there's, at least in California, mm -hmm. there isn't protection for that person's reputation or character once they've passed on. Well, I'm especially bothered by it because one of the two accusers I spent a lot of time with and was so impressed with his zeal to help Michael Jackson in the trial, and I'm talking about Wade Robson. I spent time with him before the trial. I spent time with his mother, with his sister. They were zealous supporters of Michael Jackson. They were adamant that nothing wrong had ever occurred. And I was so impressed with Wade Robson uh, in the way he presented himself. He was very likable. He was intelligent. Uh, he was very articulate and very adamant and forceful that I was never improperly touched. I was so impressed with him that I made him my first witness in the defense case. And, you know, I had to think long and hard about whether I wanted to put on a defense case because I felt the cross-examination of prosecution witnesses had been so effective that I felt 99.9% .9 of criminal defense lawyers in America would have rested their case right there. But the problem was I knew in my heart of hearts they wouldn't get a conviction at that point, but I wasn't sure I would get acquittals on every count, and I didn't want them retrying Michael Jackson. So I decided to put on a defense case, which meant taking risks, because every time you call a witness, you've got to give the prosecution a chance to cross-examination that witness and do whatever they want to do. So if you're going to put on a defense case and take the, the risks involved, you want to start strong and you want to end strong. I started with what I thought was my strongest witness for the defense, Wade Robson, and I ended with one of the strongest witnesses for the defense, Chris Tucker, the comedian. And my second witness was Macaulay Culkin, who was very powerful and said, I, I was, he's my friend, he never improperly touched me at all. But I started with Wade, who was a terrific witness and withstood withering cross-examination by a really good prosecutor, uh, Ron Zonin, one of the best prosecutors I've ever seen. Great cross-examiner, passionate, you know, detailed, committed. Uh, he couldn't bud make Wade Robson budge an inch. So when years later, when Michael's dead and can't speak out on his own behalf, suddenly Mr. Robson changes the story, that's very upsetting to me because I'm a direct participant, direct witness in what I'm talking about. Um, plus, I think it's a cheap shot to start coming after the dead when they can't speak up on their own behalf. I've not seen the four-hour documentary, Leaving Neverland, and I don't intend to see it. I know you've spoken favorably about Mr. Jackson as, as your client and, and said that he's very likable and that you, um, you, you, I'm not sure if I could say you enjoyed working with him. I'm sure, not sure if that's the right phrase, but you found him to be very likable. I imagine, though, that there's times that you work with clients that aren't as likable. Well, sure. I mean, it's a very stressful period to begin with. I mean, the, the state or the federal government are trying to take away your freedom, trying to, in a, in a sense, destroy your life. And, and that can impact all sorts of people, children, cousins, parents, you name it. You know, families are involved, too. So it's a stressful, ugly time to begin with. Um, and add to that the fact that some people are nicer than other people and some people are more stable than other people. And you do sometimes represent people who are not the nicest individuals on the planet. Uh, they don't particularly trust lawyers. Uh, given their experiences and some of the things they've heard. Lawyers aren't necessarily their favorite uh, people, and that's just part of the business. So how do you manage it when you might have a client who's ant antagonistic toward you, even though you're doing your best to assist them? I do my best to keep focused on what's important, not let their individual frailties or poor habits or you know poor behavior affect me. I do my best not to... Uh, let it get in the way. And you have clients that challenge you in their fame. So, for example, a client who is a high-profile client and brings that sense of presence, their fame, into their conversations with you. Um, is that something that, that you have found to be the case? The, 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 you do represent sometimes people with big egos, for sure. Um, and you represent people who are used to calling the shots in their life. They're used to telling their agents they want this, their managers they want that, their lawyers who do real estate or business or tax or entertainment. They'll tell them what they want. They'll call the shots, and suddenly they're in a, in a world they know nothing about, and some realize they know nothing about it, and others want to behave the same way. 
and you have to let them know this is a world unlike any world you've been in. You know, things don't work the same way they do in these other legal specialties or in the rest of the, your life uh, as you've been running it. You know, you better listen to me because a lot of what goes on in a courtroom is counterintuitive. It goes against the grain of what you've been taught. It's not like these trials you've seen on television. It's very different being in there yourself when you're the accused. So you better let uh, let the lawyer tell you what to do in certain situations or you, you may regret it later on. I had, you just reminded me, I had a murder case years ago. It was a woman sitting in L.A. County Jail, grew up in a poor neighborhood, had no money. Uh, she was charged with murdering her ex-husband, coming from San Bernardino County to Los Angeles County and murdering her ex-husband. And I got a call asking me if I would be willing to talk to her, and I said I would, and I agreed to represent her for free. And I noticed in the relationship from time to time, she seemed rather distrustful. Why are you helping me this way? I don't think she was used to anyone helping her this way. And we tried the case. I was against one of the top prosecutors in Los Angeles, a uh, very highly respected and skilled and experienced prosecutor. And uh, at one point, with the jury out of the room, she said, Your Honor, I want to tell you all the things that Mr. Mesero is doing to me that aren't right. And she started to, out loud, to list things that I think some of the people in the jail had told her he should be doing. You know, you've got a lot of jailhouse geniuses who don't know what they're doing but think they do. And I stopped her right away and said, stop that right now. You're not helping yourself. And she stopped. And to make a long story short, she was acquitted. And she still calls me periodically to thank me and hasn't forgotten. This is, you know, about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, uh, people are suspicious of lawyers. And on top of that, I was doing something very generous to her that she wasn't used to. So she was suspicious of that. You know, I've done my share of pro bono work in my career. I had another a former gang member charged with murder in the Compton courthouse uh, and a friend of a friend begged me to help him he had no money I did and he got suspicious why are you doing this for me what were you? he'd look at me why are you doing this for me why are you being so nice to me he didn't know what was going on and, and wondered one time if the DA had planted me you know <laughs> I said you know and he was acquitted uh, of murder um, and it was a uh, very, very ugly gang shooting with a number of eyewitnesses and a prosecutor who'd never lost a, a gang homicide case. He'd won over 70 of them. And uh, he realized I was, you know, I meant what I told him, that I really believe in justice. And I, you know, was brought into this case by a friend of a friend who I respect. And that's how I met you, you know, and I'm here to, to do my very best for you. So... You know, people's perceptions of lawyers are not always the greatest, and sometimes they're very incorrect. I mean, our public defenders uh, get a very bad rap in the jails and prisons. The, you know, they call them dump trucks. They call them public pretenders. Um, and some of our public defenders are the best criminal defense lawyers in the country. <clears throat> they're dedicated. They're unsung heroes and heroines, uh, and they do a great job. And, and much of the time, they do a great job uh, with no appreciation, whatever, uh, with no understanding, whatever, with great suspicion coming from the jails. And I've seen them do such a good job and not be appreciated. Um, but they will still, you know, defend whoever they're told to defend, regardless of how difficult the case is, regardless of how unpopular their, their client may, it may be, regardless of how unpopular they may be. Um, and they're, they're the unsung heroes and heroines of our justice system, the public defenders around the country. I imagine you've seen different kinds of responses among attorneys, your peers, those who handle it admirably, like you're describing, and, and work because of the passion they might feel or the conviction they might feel or, or doing the right thing, however they might describe it, and those who whose motives are more about fame and glory. And you've talked before about the perils of fame. Well, I think fame is an addiction. I think it's, an, it's a very, very addictive, powerful drug. And you just give a tiny bit of fame to your average human being, and they act like different people all of a sudden. And that really applies to lawyers. Lawyers get in a high-profile case, and a couple of cameras surround them, a couple of reporters want comments, and you see a glow in their eye, and you see a different demeanor, and suddenly they start beginning to think it's all about them. It's not all about them. It's about the client. 
and fame is a very, very, well, fame can kill. We all know that. I mean, the last I checked, the three most lucrative dead celebrities' estates were number one, Michael Jackson, you know, dead at 50, number two, Elvis Presley, dead at 42, and number three, Marilyn Monroe, dead at 36. So fame can kill you. Fame will make you think things about yourself that are not realistic. Fame will get you treatment that no one else would give any that no one else would get. I mean, look at poor Michael Jackson being given propofol to help sleep. If you or I had an insomnia problem and went to a physician, they'd never give us propofol for that purpose. Uh, look at the medications that were given to Elvis Presley, and I, perhaps Marilyn Monroe. I'm not quite sure. Um, some people think that was a suicide and may have been an overdose, but nevertheless. Celebrities are treated differently because they're celebrities. And sometimes they're treated differently in ways that are fatal. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to be your friend, and everybody's got something you need, and everybody wants to remind you of what they did to you, for you when you were coming up, so you'll owe them something. And everybody wants a loan, and everybody wants this favor. And if you give them a loan, they resent you, and if you don't give them a loan, they resent you. I mean, I can talk about fame forever. It's a very dangerous, addictive commodity. And you've got to be very careful with lawyers who've had a fair amount of fame because they may think it's all about them and not you, the client. Have you ever witnessed, and you, you wouldn't have to say who, of course, but have you ever witnessed an attorney who was addicted to their own fame and then you've seen that addiction cost their client? Well, it would be my opinion that it costs the client. Oh, yes, of course, of course. I've seen things that are very unacceptable, very disturbing, to me as a, uh, as a criminal defense attorney. I've seen lawyers clearly think it's all about them and get completely enamored by the media. I've even heard of one who was entertaining the media every, you know, most nights during a very high profile trial. And uh, even the media people who told me about it thought it was foolish. But they were going to take advantage of it if they could. And the media know that lawyers can be manipulated and that lawyers are suckers for fame. So, you know, I've had media representatives, you know, suggest to me they could do all sorts of things if I would help them in a certain way. And, uh, you know, for most people, I think what their approach probably would have worked. It didn't with me. Well, your, your conviction is very clear, the way that you're true to your own principles and, and your own approach. And I know that you, you developed that over, over a number of years of, of your experience, just the willingness to take risks, the willingness to be unconventional, you talk in many of your writings about the fact that you approach things sometimes very unconventionally. Yes, and I think that's the, the product of taking my profession very seriously. <clears throat> and as I said before, at one point early in my career, I said, why are some lawyers better than others? You know, we all go to law school, we all pass the bar exam, we all take trial practice classes, we all take refresher classes that we're required to take uh, to continue to be a practicing lawyer. We all go to seminars. Um, why are some better than others? What is it? What, what made the difference? And I would read biographies. I would read autobiographies. I would go down to watch lawyers try cases. I would look at videotapes and audio tapes in the old days. You know, now, of course, it's on the Internet. But um, I would do whatever I could to find some kernel of something that made these people different or better. And I decided that, uh, you know, Knowing yourself, number one, was critical. Uh, experience was critical. But trying to find where the heart of a case was and what story really resonates from the facts and taking risks to get witnesses to help you uh, or conversely to get witnesses to hurt the other side. Uh, th that it was an art, not a science, that you'll never completely master it. You're always learning if you're lucky. Uh, and I looked at some of the lawyers who were considered good, but maybe not that great, and a lot of them basically stopped learning. They reached a level of experience and success that made them think, you know, my learning's over. You know, I'll teach you how to do it. An arrogance, a narcissism that, uh, in my opinion, stopped their growth and didn't help them. So a willingness to learn is, is important. Very important, and a willingness to try hard cases because there are a lot of lawyers out there who handpick their cases. They're afraid to lose. They're afraid a loss will tarnish their reputation or will hurt their sales pitch uh, to unsuspecting clients. And I've always said, 
Try the hardest cases. Try them your whole career. Don't shy away from anything. You know, every case teaches you something new. And do your best you know, under the worst circumstances and make our system work. You've said the same thing about adverse experiences and situations in the courtroom to not shy away from those but but to really face those head on I think uh, you should embrace the things that are most difficult and find a way out of them that helps your client and you know helps you help your client um, you know we all know as you walk through life you know there's the, the half full glass example you know the optimist looks at uh, how much is in the glass and the pessimist looks at how much is not in the glass well that can apply to any tough experience in the courtroom you know uh, you try to find what you can that will help your client and help you get the job done are there days when you're not an optimist are there days when when you you feel as though you you don't have what it takes to to face the courtroom that day or or would you say that you just trust yourself enough um, and your own self-efficacy enough to make it through? There are tough days because if you're a caring person, if you're a sensitive person, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have good days and tough days. and You just can't overreact to them because the story hasn't been completed yet. But I think that any really conscious, caring lawyer has a sensitive level uh, emotionally that will in, in, insist that you have some bad days. There are callous lawyers out there. They don't care. They're burned out on jails. They're burned out on violence and blood and guts and, you know, difficult clients. They're burned out. They're just making a living. So they tune out to some of the areas I'm talking about. So they don't get bothered as much. Um, but if you really care you are going to toss and turn. Should I have put that witness on? Should I have put my client on? Uh, there are times you put a client on, which you don't have to in a criminal case, and the client will have some bad moments, and your heart will just, as you're watching, drop into your stomach. You know, you're just trying to keep a, uh, a very even keel persona, and you're trying not to look like anything's bothering you, but I mean, inside, you're, you're, you're doing somersaults. And after a loss, you know, if you care, you, you have what I call the dark night of the soul. You toss and turn, but, you know, should I have done this? Should I have done that? Um, but you have to have tough moments if you care, I think. I'm sure uh, people who are listening can really relate to what you just described because it's part of the human condition to have those moments where you, you experience things from on, on a spectrum from regret to just second guessing or questioning yourself to just the the, um, the inner turmoil of things that that are challenging and, and sometimes don't go your way. Well, I mean that that that's that's just true. I mean, and and sometimes you have to understand that what you think is a victory uh, may or may not be a victory, and what you think is a loss may or not be a loss. I mean, it may be that you walk into a courtroom defending a murder case where you're hoping you can get a manslaughter conviction because the facts are so bad um, and you come out with a manslaughter conviction and you, you feel very very good about it I mean um, uh, you, you'd like to get an acquittal on every count but sometimes getting convicted of a lesser offense is still given all and all the facts and given the situation is actually a win it's interesting because you bring up the lesser offenses, uh, um, and I remember in the in the Jackson trial, um, something occurred in in that trial which gave the opportunity to the jury to find Michael Jackson guilty of lesser offenses. This I don't think even was something that was present when the trial began. I think that was something that occurred as the trial progressed. It's true. The J Michael Jackson was indicted by a grand jury on ten felony counts. That's the way we began the trial when the judge gave the charge to the jury, which is a fancy way of saying he told them what they're to consider. He, on his own volition, he, on his own motion, decided to give them the option of convicting on four lesser-included misdemeanor counts. What the judge said to the jury was, if on any of those last four counts you find 
Mr. Jackson not guilty. You may still convict on a what is called a lesser included misdemeanor count, which is giving alcohol to an underage person. And they came back with 14 not guilties, not guilty on the 10 indicted felony counts, and not guilty on the four lesser included misdemeanor counts of giving alcohol to an underage person. We walked into that trial, nobody gave us a chance. In fact, some of my close friends warned me, don't take the case. They said it's going to be the most watched case in, in American history. Um, it's going to be watched by millions of Jackson fans around the world. Uh, you can't win it. Um, everywhere you go for the rest of your life, you're going to be the one who sent Michael Jackson to prison. And I know some lawyers who strongly urged me not to take it and said they wouldn't take it. How, did that pressure get to you? Not really. I thought about it, and that's not who I am. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Listen, there are lawyers who, if they won a case like that, would be very careful what other trials they did um, because they'd want to retain this aura of invincibility. And I don't do that either. You know, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I try challenging cases. I try cases that people warn me not to take. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. I'm proud I'm not a, a cherry picker like some famous lawyers I know who stick their toe in the water to see what the temperature is, to see if they really think they can win it. I'm proud to not uh, not operate that way. Well, it's clear that you know yourself very well, which I'm sure helps you in your work. As I said when we met last, I really could talk to you for hours and hours because it's, it's fascinating. It really is. Um, but I don't want to keep you much longer. I'm, I'm just going to switch gears, if you don't mind, and ask you sure. some questions that I ask of everyone that I speak to. Uh, so we'll jump into that if that's okay. Yeah. So Tom, what in life are you still curious about? I'm curious about all kinds of things. Uh, I mean, I'm curious about uh, my family that I love dearly. I'm curious about myself. Uh, I feel like you're always learning and always, you know, developing if you're lucky. I'm curious about uh, life in general. Our, our justice system will always be of curiosity to me because it's always changing, it's always trying to evolve into something better, but it never is perfect. Um, I'm curious about people and how complex they are and how they change with the times and how what we prioritize seems to change with the times, particularly the age of social media, which I don't know that much about, and I'm not a social media person, but the impact on our youth, the impact on our society or civilization is fascinating to uh, to try and work through. And it impacts the courtroom, I would imagine, too? Well, yes, because you're always worried about what's going to impact a jury. And, and even though judges tell jurors or potential jurors not to look at social media about the case, you, you don't know if they're really doing that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, which is more distracting to you in, in the courtroom or as you do your work, praise or criticism? Well, I'd rather take the criticism than the praise. Praise doesn't teach me very much. Uh, we all like it. We all smile a little bit when someone praises us, um, uh, but it doesn't teach you very much. I like, I love to talk to jurors after trial, and uh, whether I win it or lose it, I always like to ask them, "Did I do anything that upset you or irritated you? Do you can you think of any area where I can improve?" I always do that. I've noticed that lawyers just love to get praised, uh, out, you know, when a trial's over by jurors and. If they were smart, they'd say, well, tell me somewhere I can improve. Did anything I do irritate you? Did the way I treated any witness upset you? And find out whatever you can. You're willing to make yourself vulnerable enough to receive criticism. You're, you're soliciting it in order to make yourself better at what you do. I think that's, uh, I think that's a better way to live, period, let alone just you know how to try a case. I think... We should always be looking for constructive criticism to help us evolve as people and, and do a better job with, uh, with our short lives. A certain level of success uh, gives people a narcissistic you know, shell and can actually shut them out of constructive criticism, you know, helpful suggestions, how to improve themselves, and I hopefully don't live that way. Tom, as a, as a courtroom attorney, you obviously prepare for every trial, which we've spoken a little bit about, and yet the unexpected can happen. Is there a time when something unexpected has happened to you and you felt like it threw you off, like it, it really um, set some of your progress aside? 
Part of being a trial lawyer is to be prepared for the unknown, for the unexpected. Witnesses you thought would clobber you end up helping you. Witnesses you thought would help you end up clobbering you. Um, the unexpected is a continuum in trials. And you don't really know who those jurors are. You know, you, 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 you see them for the first time in a courtroom setting. You get a little information about their background. Um, uh, you, you're able to question them a little bit, depending on what courtroom you're in. Some federal courtrooms, judges won't let you question them at all. They will do the questioning. But nevertheless, uh, you have these people up there who you don't really know and who may not even know who they are themselves. I mean, so you're dealing with all this uncertainty. You don't know what's going to resonate with them. You don't know who's going to take control in the jury room, who's going to have more staying power, who's going to be more locked into their positions. and and. All of this is uncertain, it's unknown. Um, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty as you walk into a trial. So um, you have to be ready for that. Sometimes you react better to it some days than other days. Um, but I've had witnesses shock me with, um, with things they said and things they did. Um, and that's just part of the game, yeah. So you control what's controllable. and You do your best. You do your best. You're taught how to control situations in the courtroom as best you can. Um, but again, you don't know how any of this is impacting jurors. If you try to restrict a witness and control them and don't let them go off on tangents, a juror might say, that person's tricky. They're just manipulating the, the juror. We want to hear everything. We want to hear everything they have to say. You just don't know how that will impact if you object too much. You don't know if some jurors will say that person's a trickster, that person's a technician, you know, they're trying to block the truth. You just don't know. You do your best uh, in the situation you're in. What is one comment that still stands out to you because of its impact, whether that's good, bad, or for whatever reason? Well, I tried a very ugly death penalty case about probably 18 years ago, I think, uh, in the state of Alabama. I did it pro bono. My client was a white man who had been on Alabama's death row for six years. He had been convicted of a double homicide. Um, two young men were innocently just shot to death in a park, and there was evidence of drug use and, and devil worship and other things, and the jury convicted him and sent him to death row. The conviction was reversed on a pure technicality, and it came back for a retrial, and I was asked if I would help defend him. And I said I would. And uh, it looked like an extremely difficult case uh, just on paper. I'll say that he had testified in the first trial that he was using these different drugs. Uh, any rate, uh, I agreed to defend him. Um, part of our defense was that one of the prosecution's main witnesses was actually the one who did the murders. And he had been a friend of our client. He had been a main witness against him in the first trial. Um, saying that basically our client had admitted doing all this to him and told him what happened. So I'm cross-examining this person on the stand, and he doesn't realize what I'm doing, but I'm asking him very detailed questions about the crime scene. And he claimed that everything he knew he had learned from the client. So I'm asking him about the distance between this factor and that factor. I'm asking him to describe how this body was positioned. I asked him to describe how another body was positioned. I asked him about shell casings. Were they on the ground? Where were they? And he was answering in precise detail all these questions. And at one point, and, and he didn't realize what I was showing the jury was that he didn't learn this just from being told. You know, you can't remember this from just, you know, have a normal, normal conversation with a friend. So at, in, in Alabama, the courts permit what are called speaking objections. And a speaking objection means you, can, you object and you give the reason for your objection in front of the jury. In most states like California, you can object, but you can only give a very abbreviated description of what the objection is. Otherwise, you have to do it at sidebar, outside the presence of the jury. You know, uh, in other words, you can say objection relevance in California. But if there's any more to discuss, you say, Your Honor, may we approach? And then you discuss outside the presence or hearing of the jury 
why you think it's irrelevant. But in Alabama, they have speaking objections right in front of the jury. So at one point, I asked this person, I switched gears and said to him, isn't it true that on one occasion you took, a, you took a handgun and put it to a baby's head? And the prosecutor jumped up and said, objection, relevance. And the judge said to me in front of the jury, what's the relevance, Mr. Mesereau? And I said, Your Honor, the relevance is, and I pointed to the witness, that's the killer. And he had an expression on his face, which was almost, he was almost agreeing with me. His head sort of went up and looked like it was going up and down, and he was smiling. And I think that may have been the key moment in the case. My client was acquitted. Uh, my co-counsel says it was the most Perry Mason-like moment he's ever seen in a, uh, in a criminal courtroom. And he does lots of capital murder cases in Alabama. He's, he's the best capital defender in, in the city of Birmingham. But that was where someone didn't say something, but their demeanor and their reaction, in my opinion, spoke volumes. And of course, in our closing arguments, we talked a lot about that. That really is a Perry Mason moment, for That's sure. <laughs> yes, yes. My goodness, wow. And I know you had some of those moments in, in the Michael Jackson case as well, which um, we spoke about, but didn't actually make it onto the recording because of my recorder last time, where you were questioning one of the main accusers, um, a, a, a member of the, of the family of one of the main accusers about the pornography that he had alleged that Michael Jackson had shown him. And it, it turned out, I'll let you explain it. Well, that, that was the brother of the primary accuser who claimed he had seen his brother being molested. And the, both of the brothers had claimed that Michael Jackson was showing them pornography. And the prosecution's theory was that this was designed to condition them uh, to be molested. Um, so the prosecution had introduced into evidence a lot of pornography, but it was heterosexual pornography. It was Playboy and Penthouse and things like that. Uh, they introduced a edition of Playboy that this witness said Michael Jackson had shown him. Um, you know, the, the word is grooming. The, the, basically, the prosecution was saying this was part of the grooming process to prepare these children to be molested. So I got up on cross-examination and said to him, you know, words to the effect, I don't remember exactly what the question was, that you're sure he showed you this magazine? And he said, absolutely. And then I proved that the magazine wasn't even published until after they had the family had left Neverland. And that was a, a good moment for us. But the prosecution kept showing to the jury one naked picture of naked women after another and I was thinking to myself do they really think this is helping and I don't think it did and I think the verdict showed it didn't so this is a different kind of question now um, on the on the heels of that one but but how do you move on from failure you uh, you're depressed for a while you're down uh, you're upset but you realize it's part of your business and it's part of your profession and you're, as I say, if you care, if you're sensitive, uh, it, it, it sticks to you for a little while. But then you move on and you bounce back like we all have to do in life in many different situations. Have you ever had what you would say was a transformative moment in your work? And if so, what was it? A transformative moment in my work. Um, Well, you know, I, when I was coming up, I did a lot of low pay and pro bono cases, um, which I'm very proud of. And I still do a pro bono murder case in Alabama every year. Um, I have a small free legal clinic where we, twice a month, at an African-American church, we counsel people, lawyers and law students and <clears throat> volunteers, paralegals donate their time. I'm very proud of this kind of work. I, I, I marched with the women of Watts every year for the last 16 years, 17 years, uh, against gang violence through the projects with the children to try and help the situation as best I can. Um, these, I often tell lawyers, because we live in such a, society to me is becoming more greedy. 
the cost of living is high, the cost of education is high, the cost of housing is impossible. Uh, young people fe come out of school feeling like they're, they've got a mortgage without a house, you know, and in a situation like this, to tell people they should do something pro bono or charitable is often falls on deaf ears. Um, but I always tell people, you're going to get more out of it than the people you help. You watch what it does for your spirit and your soul. There's so many unha unhappy lawyers who would feel better if they did something like this. But I took a case in 1995 or 96. I represented a former city councilwoman in Compton who had been indicted by a federal grand jury for various counts of corruption. And they had, the, the FBI had infiltrated her life in very unsavory ways. They had an informant. She was African American. They picked an African American man who was a convicted felon who was working with them, had him approach her with flowers in her office. Uh, he gave her a card saying he was a success, essentially presented himself as a successful businessman who would get her involved in the company, took tra trip, travel to Mexico with her. Uh, I thought it was very unsavory what they did. And they taped her for over a year, allegedly taking bribes. And they admitted that it took them about a year to get her to take one, which I thought was unfair. But then they taped, they taped recorded her for another year, you know, in their minds, taking improper payments. I took the case pro bono. There were about over 600 tapes, audio and video in the case, massive amount of documents. Um, and at one point, I, it was a Saturday night, I was in my office in Century City, just weary from listening to tapes. <clears throat> and I heard this tape and something sounded off. And there was clanking in the background, there was discussion about Notre Dame football. And I realized that two FBI agents and their informant were waiting for her to arrive for allegedly the first payment. And the informant says words to the effect, they're greedy, every black one's coming from everywhere, let's put her on ice and get another one. And I was appalled by this discussion. And it was clear to me they were accidentally taping themselves. Now I had been given transcripts prepared by the FBI of these conversations. The government had already tried the mayor in the same investigation. They had tapes of him. He had, he had resources. So he hired private counsel who clearly didn't just listen to the tapes. They read the FBI transcripts. I looked at the FBI transcript, and it left out this stuff. So I made a motion to dismiss the indictment for selective prosecution based on race and mentioned that a B FBI agents and the informant had a discussion and filed a motion and the government was just indignant and the prosecutor was a very good prosecutor said he had talked to the agents and they hadn't done this and then I just pulled this tape out of my pocket and said why don't we listen to this and it was a pretty dramatic moment uh, they were horribly embarrassed the judge would not dismiss the case but um, she was not impressed with their behavior but I say she wouldn't dismiss the case it was a moment, you know, a lot of people said to me, why are you doing this case? She's been on the news. They've showed these tapes with her taking money. And I said, look, you know, um, their behavior was deplorable. Putting this man in her life to become her lover, to travel to Mexico with her. He became one of her campaign managers. I said, this is absolutely, you know, beyond the pale. Then I found another tape where they were talking to a former mayor who was African-American, they were talking about offering him a white blonde woman in a hotel. And of course, he doesn't know he's being taped or set up. And I just thought this was very unsavory behavior, even though she was convicted. But she was acquitted of a lot of counts, which um, very upset the government tremendously. And she got a very minimal sentence, below, way below what they wanted. I felt very good about exposing this in the way I did. And this is another example, I hope, of what criminal defense lawyers do. We, we make them think twice about bending the rules. When I say them, I mean government, prosecutors, FBI agents, police, 
whatever agency is, is working with the prosecution, we call them to task when they do things that are improper. We may not <clears throat> totally win the case, but we win a lot for liberty and for freedom for all of us when we expose this kind of stuff. So you say transformative. That was a, something I was very proud of. It burned a hole in my bank account, I will, I will tell you that. <laughs> it transformed more than one aspect of your life. <laughs> well, finally, Tom, in, in brief, um, what have you learned about yourself from your particular work as a trial attorney? I think I've learned that I can be effective in this particular setting. I think I've learned that I combine, I hope, a certain level of toughness with compassion and empathy and kindness um, that works, you know. Um, <clears throat> I certainly have learned that uh, we live in a very difficult society where greed and callousness towards others is alive and well. And, you know, the late Clarence Darrow, one of my heroes, uh, who was one of the greatest trial lawyers in American history, tried very difficult cases in very difficult settings. And saw the worst of society and saw the worst of government oppression and misuse of power. And he could be fierce in the courtroom and snide and sarcastic and going after the other side. But I think people also who watched him knew there was a compassion and a kindness and a humanity to him that you rarely saw. I would like to think that I have an empathy and a compassion that, that comes out. Uh, I think it's a strength, not a weakness. I think there's a misnomer about tough lawyers. Tough lawyers sometimes are the worst and least effective lawyers, and sometimes decent, honorable lawyers who are human and not perfect are more effective. Um, I think I've learned that I'm compassionate and kind and that that can be a strength, I hope. Well, you are very kind to spend your time meeting with me, and I have learned a lot from you, so I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Well, it's been my pleasure, and uh, very much appreciate you ask great questions, and thank you for thinking of me. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. This has been Manage the Moment with Dr. Shep. Life is a collection of moments, it's how you manage the moments that makes the difference. My sincere thanks again to Tom Mesro for joining me for this conversation. And thank you for listening. You can subscribe to the Manage the Moment podcast for free just by clicking the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast. And then you'll be sure to get the newest episodes as soon as they're uploaded. And for more information about the Manage the Moment podcast, you can see the episode notes for this broadcast. And you'll also find us on social media, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Shep. Thanks so much for listening and taking the time to share these moments with us. Until next time.